latent health problems, pulled a limp in his left leg, and in addition, set him on a life trajectory shaped by disability. Even less could anyone have foreseen that the child would become the most important Peruvian intellectual of the 20th century. Described as the first Marxist of Latin America, Mariategui was to become a central figure of the Latin, Latin American left and the continental intellectual scene. During his lifetime, he would publish more than 2,500 articles on a wide variety of topics from World War I to the Russian Revolution, chapter in cinema and psychoanalysis. The magazine Amalta, which he founded in 1926, represented an unparalleled milestone in the cultural avant-garde of the 1920s. His book, Siete Ensayos de Interpretación de la Realidad Peruana, published in 1928, has been read by thousands, perhaps millions of readers in multiple languages. He founded the Peruvian Socialist Party, renamed after his death as the Peruvian Communist Party, as well as the General Confederation of Peruvian Workers, the main trade union organization. In 1930, at the age of 35, Mariategui died, leaving behind an unparalleled intellectual and political legacy that influenced several generations in Peru and abroad. Although much has been written about Mariategui and his political and cultural work, the key role that disability played in his life has not received attention. Mariategui's disability is both present and absent in studies of his life and work. When it is present, his biographers usually mention two key episodes. First, the accident at the age of seven in 1902 in Huacho, uh, a town about an hour away from Lima, and his subsequent stay at the Maison de Santé, a clinic of the French charitable society located in Lima. Secondly, the amputation of his right leg in 1924. The childhood accident plays a particularly important role. It is a sort of origin story that triggers a particular life journey. It serves to mark a life experience in which disability becomes a daily struggle, but also one in which disability con constitutes an identity and a challenge. In several accounts, disability and illness appear as the trigger for Mariategui's genius. In particular, it is said, the long stay at the hospital, the Maison de Santé, produces his fondness for reading, for languages, bestows upon him a certain cosmopolitanism, and sets him on a self-taught and idiosyncratic path in a struggle for agonizing life, as Alberto Flores Galindo has suggested, towards the creation of the amauta, which is a Quechua word for teacher or master. So the amauta of Peruvian thought, or the global heterodox Marxist thinker. In other words, Mariategui's disability appears in these accounts as a necessary condition for his heroic creation. However, at the same time, Mariategui's disability is absent in many of the studies dedicated to him. Like Antonio Gramsci, studied by David Forgash, Mariategui is often undisabled in representation, perhaps because disability is not a desirable trait in Marxist or revolutionary icons. The most famous image of Mariategui, for example, is a photograph taken by the Argentine painter, painter Jose Malanca. And whoever sees it has no way of knowing that it was taken with Mariategui sitting in his wheelchair because of the cropping. And this is true also of the way that Gramsci is usually represented. Likewise, the monument to Mariategui on uh, 28 Julio Avenue in downtown Lima depicts him seated, but his legs are covered by a large blanket under which Mariategui's two feet are showing, so that his physical disability is literally covered while his amputated leg has grown back. Perhaps Mariategui's disability has not received the attention it deserves because he himself did not address it in his writings. From Italy in 1921, he wrote about a house for the war blind, but said little about the blind themselves, whom he imagines to be mired in pain and, quote, resigned to their misfortune, end of quote. A few years before his trip to Europe, he had written in the newspaper La Prensa about neurasthenia and suicide and their effect on Lima's youth. In Labor, the magazine he founded in 1928, he published several articles on social security, security plans in different countries of the world, 
while public health was not absent from his concerns. But physical and mental disability did not occupy an important place in his work, nor was it a motive for political activism. Perhaps this is because, unlike the Indian question or the labor question, central themes in his intellectual production and political activism, Mariategui did not understand disability in its proper social and political dimension, as did, for example, his near contemporary, <coughs> the American essayist and radical thinker, Randolph Byrne. As Paul Longmore and Paul Stephen Miller show, Byrne, in the essay, A Philosophy of Handicap, published in 1913, presented, quote, a social analysis that explains the experience of disability by situating it within the larger patterns and structure of the unjust modern social order, end of quote. But this approach to disability would not have been alien to Mariategui. Mm -hmm. However, he did not adopt it. It is important to emphasize that the history of disability in Peru has yet to be written. The need to do so is due both to the need to counteract the marginalization of a historically excluded group and to the fact that a history that does not pay attention to the experience of disability is necessarily incomplete. By studying Mariategui from the perspective of the history of disability, we gain new understandings on, of the individual and his life trajectory. Studies that focus only on ideas, activism, or political involvement leave key questions about Mariategui and his work unanswered or even unasked. So my talk approaches this question from two angles. First, by focusing on how Mariategui's disability has been represented, both visually and in texts. Second, by focusing on his experience of disability, using a variety of sources, and in particular, his correspondence. His letters reveal the extent to which he perceived disability as something that impacted his life trajectory, his intellectual production, and even his political work. Moreover, this analysis reveals that disability became a key element in the positive representation of Mariategui by his contemporaries, by himself, and later by those who studied him. Mariategui's ability to overcome disability became central to the value placed on his intellectual and political contribution. Ultimately, I propose that Mariategui's disability was understood as the root of his exceptionality and inspiration. Mariategui's visual repertoire allows, allows for two things. First, to think about the visibility of his disability, and second, uh, to think about the way that he managed to give a meaning to disability other than its usual association with vulnerability and marginalization. Despite the central role that disability supposedly assumes in his formative years, Mariategui's disability is not visible in the photographs of his childhood and youth. In the photograph of Mariategui and his brother, Julio Cesar, taken in 1904, which you can see here, that is two years after the accident that supposedly triggered or at least physically manifested his illness, it is not possible to glean any disability. None of the photographs of Mariategui before or during his time in Europe, you can see him here in Rome, uh, Mariategui spent four years in, in Europe between 1919 and 1923. He was deported by the president at the time, Augusto Leguia, who was concerned about his increasing political activism. And uh, Mariategui spent uh, those years mostly in Italy, uh, but he also traveled elsewhere, France and Germany. So in these photographs, uh, there is no evident representation of his disability and here in this photograph which is from when he returned to Peru the same apply, applies. No cane is visible in any of the, these photographs nor is there any visual suggestion that Mariategui limped. Luis Alberto Sanchez, an intellectual and APA politician, wrote in one of his writings, quote, Mariategui had a crippled leg since he was a child. He limped when he walked but he did not need a cane, end of quote. This photographic non-representation suggests an attempt by Mariategui to challenge the vulnerability and marginalization associated with disability. In fact, only in non-photographic visual representations do we find Mariategui's disability graphically represented. This is a case of a pair of illustrations by the artist uh, Carlos Tovar or Carlin, 
is known, in which Mariategui is represented with a cane. It is also the case of the cinematographic representation of Mariategui in the film by director Federico Garcia. Uh, this film is called, entitled El Amauta, it's also known as the Junta Brava. The film narrates the life of Mariategui from his childhood until his trip to Europe in 1919. The first scene of the film depi depicts the accident that produced the limp, thus establishing, as in other interpretations, the key role of this incident as an origin story. In the film, Mariategui, now a young man, makes constant <coughs> use of a cane to get around, and his limp is mocked by fellow La Prensa journalists. However, these visual representations are at odds with the photographs of Mariategui, where, as I have argued, he seems to try to conceal, conceal his limp. In contrast, following the operation that resulted in the amputation of Mariategui's right leg in 1924, the visual repertoire makes visible his disability in an overt manner. The photograph that shows Mariategui in bed, surrounded by his doctors and his friends and colleagues, is particularly important. Mariategui is represented in a manner that expresses, expresses a clear state of vulnerability. The photograph shows an extremely weakened man with an unusual moustache that suggests that the patient has not been able to shave because of the seriousness of his condition. The gravity is also conveyed by Mariategui's gaze at the camera, a gaze that suggests a state of alertness and fear. Finally, both the gazes of the four men looking at the camera and even more clearly those of the two men not looking at the camera convey the extreme gravity of the situation. This vulnerability is perhaps also conveyed by the homosocial character of the photograph. Men appear in the photograph but with heteronormative masculinities diminished by the situation. This image of vulnerability in turn contrasts with a series of images that show Mariategui in his wheelchair. So here he's um, together with representatives of a miners union from the Central Highlands. Here with some of his um, uh, intellectual friends. Here with those <coughs> friends, including uh, Miguel Adler and um, Noemi Milstein, who are uh, Latin Americanists here, Claudio Lombard's grandparents. Here with uh, the Bolivian uh, anarchist socialist uh, Tristan Marot. And here you can see him with Waldo Frank and Luis Alberto Sanchez. While Mariategui's disability is clearly visible in these images, both because of the wheelchair and the fact that several photographs clearly show that his right leg has been amputated, they do not express vulnerability. On the contrary, Mariategui appears in these photographs, yes, as a fragile figure protected by those who surround him, but at the same time as dominant and important. In most of the photographs, he appears in the center of the composition, flanked on either side by his companions. By placing him in the focal point, the composition clearly establishes his importance and relegates his companions to subordinate, supportive, and protective roles. The position of his companions in relation to him indicates their relative importance. Uh, sorry. This is the case of the pho photograph of Tristan Maroc, the Bolivian Marxist intellectual seated next to Mariategui, where he leans forward like Mariategui, reproducing his gesture but to a lesser extent, as if acknowledging his subordinate status. It's also the case in the photograph with Waldo Frank and Luis Alberto Sanchez, who although standing and therefore in a position that denotes superiority towards Mariategui, are relegated to a subordinate position by the composition, which undoubtedly centers Mariategui as the most important figure in the photograph. These photographs show how, despite or because, perhaps because of the visibility of his disability, Mariategui is visualized in a way that reflects his undoubted importance and thus den denies, or at any rate, calls into question the association between disability and vulnerability or marginalization. It is interesting in this sense to also highlight the existence of several photographs that show Mariategui in a wheelchair in a family environment. In the photograph of his wife, Ana Chiape, 
she is represented leaning on Mariategui's wheelchair, thus suggesting that Mariategui's gender role as the Pater Familias, uh, who supports his wife and family, remains intact. Similarly, a series of photographs show Mariategui with his children. In these photographs, the wheelchair becomes a space that welcomes the children, protects them, and serves as a medium in which a father's affection towards them can be made manifest. Thus, these photographs, while making Mariategui's disability visible, at the same time serve to reaffirm Mariategui's ability to fulfill his gender role as husband and father. Ultimately, despite the disability, or again, perhaps because of it, these visualizations of Mariategui serve to reaffirm his patriarchal masculinity in the family context. The presence of Mariategui's wheelchair in the photographic collection opens a window into a key issue in disability studies, its relationship to technology, or more broad broadly, to the material culture of disability. But it also allows us to look at the ways in which disabled people like Mariategui sought to adapt to an ableist world. Mariategui's biographers mention that he used the streetcar or tram to get around Lima. Perhaps access to this mobility technology allowed him to dispense with the cane, another technology which made his disability visible. In the case of the wheelchair, the available evidence suggests that Mariategui assumed it to be indispensable. I have not found any information on how he obtained it, whether it was built locally or imported. Presumably, even in the 1920s, wheelchairs were not common in Peru and were probably expensive. In the last years of his life, Mariategui gained access to another key and expensive technology, uh, an automobile. Although he had previously used cars owned by acquaintances, in 1929, he bought um, with his friend and Socialist Party co-founder, Hugo Peche, a Chrysler car. This allowed him to move around the city with some ease, although only for a short time as he would die a few months later. Mariategui also had a telephone installed at home, which allowed him to communicate with many people, and in particular with the editors of Variedades and Mundial, two weeklies for which he wrote. Another fundamental technology related to Mariategui's disability was the longed-for orthopedic leg, or prosthesis, which, as we will see later, became very important in the last years of his life and in his decision to emigrate to Argentina. As David Heavey suggests, when disabled people are photographed, it is usually to celebrate the work done by others in seeking or achieving their inclusion, or alternatively, to highlight their disabled status. It is quite likely that most photographic representations of disabled people in the first decades of the 20th century in Peru conform to this idea. It's a study that needs to be done. However, in the case of Mariategui, what we perceive is, perceive is something different. Unlike most disabled people, he managed to control his image, or at least, um, in, at least in photographs. He achieved this before the amputation by making the limp in his left leg invisible. And also afterward, afterwards, by re-signifying his disability, by eliminating or at least reducing the association with vulnerability and marginalization imposing, rather, a representation of himself as a paterfamilias and also <clears throat> as an intellectual figure. In short, photography was another technology, like the streetcar, the wheelchair, the automobile, or the telephone, that Mariategui used to attach to his experience of disability a sense contrary to the hegemonic one. So in the time I have left, I want to briefly summarize two themes that I developed in a lot more detail in, in the paper on which this is based. Um, so the textual representation of Mariategui's disability and Mariategui's self-representation of his disability. Mariategui's disability, disability appears in documents written by various people who knew him. Among these documents is a letter written to him in 1918 by the writer and poet and close friend, Abraham Valdelomar, from the city of Trujillo, where he comments on the talks he has given in that city and his imminent trip to Cajamarca. In the letter, Valdelomar signs off, I embrace you with all my soul, cojito genial, mm. which I would translate as lame genius. The figure of the cojito in the diminutive reappears in several documents written after Mariategui's death. 
In the biographical sketch written in July 1930, two months after Mariategui's death, Luis Alberto Sanchez writes, quote, in 1912, El Cojito Mariategui was about to turn 17. But if in Valdelomar's phrase, the adjective genial, genius, and the context of the sentence, an affectionate farewell, te abrazo con toda mi alma, I embrace you with all my soul, attached to the mention of Mariategui's physical impairment, a humorous but friendly tone, in Sanchez's more purely descriptive comment, we can glimpse a more contemptuous tone, suggesting that a more accurate translation in this case might be the cripple Mariategui. In short, depending on the context, Mariategui's disability could be represented in different ways and given different meaning. I'm particularly interested in the relationship between disability and genius established by Valle Lomar's phrase, uh, as it is present in several texts. In Maria Vise's biography, Maria Vise was a contemporary of Mariategui. She, uh, she was an artist, and some of her work was published in Amalfa. Mariategui's limp is directly associated with his intellect. Recalling his beginnings in journalism, Thesis says, quote, when people talk about him, this phrase jumps out. El cojito mariati, he is very intelligent. intelligent. Thus, the intelligence of the cojito had been imposed in Lima. It is known that he is one of the finest and most modern writers in the Lima press, end of quote. The relationship between disability and genius also appears in Armando Bazan's 1939 biography. Bazan compares Mariategui's experience to that of Beethoven. Quote, Mariategui's life shares more than one similarity with that of that poor boy who in a German city learned to play piano under the implacable rule of his father and who already a brilliant musician lost the ability to hear sounds of the world and the voices of men. I, who had the perhaps undeserved privilege of living with Mariategui from the moment he became for, forever invalid, prostrate, know to what depths and to what height this pain reached to transform itself, as in the case of the divine deaf man, into <coughs> joy, into a source of inexhaustible work and absolute happiness." End of quote. In this interpretation, genius not only compensates for disability. For Bassan, disability makes genius possible. Mariategui's pain, he tells us, is transformed into a source of work and happiness, which, as in the case of Beethoven, bears fruit for the good of humanity. The Peruvian intellectual is a product of his disability, which becomes in this reading a kind of martyrdom and necessary sacrifice. These narratives reflect what in the field of disability studies is sometimes called the supercrip. That is, representations of disabled people that emphasize overcoming, inspiration, and exceptionality. Both Passang and Vise narrate Mariategui's beginnings in journalism as a teenager from this perspective. Both highlight the fact that Mariategui was forced to walk extensively in order to do his work. They highlight precisely what his disability supposedly prevented him from doing. According to Vise, Mariategui, quote, has to walk, difficult walks for his ailing leg, all over Lima, end of quote. Similarly, Bassan notes, quote, so with his injury already causing him discomfort, when walking, he had to walk incessantly inside and outside the workshop and covered on foot all the streets of Lima. End of quote. In both cases, this way of narrating Mariategui's capacity to overcome the limitations imposed by his disability serves precisely to point out his exceptionality and to underscore his experience of overcoming as an inspiration for others. Thus, in these accounts, Mariategui is clearly placed in the sphere of the worthy disabled, those who, despite their disability, contribute to society, and outside the sphere of the unworthy disabled, those who not only do not contribute to society, but serve to debase it. This narrative of overcoming serves to establish Mariategui as a source of inspiration, not only at a personal level, but also politically. In a text published in 1946, the leader of the Peruvian Communist Party, Jorge del Prado, writes, quote, nothing is more expressive of the profound concept he had of his responsibility than that anecdote referring to his first crisis, the first crisis of his illness. Everyone believed that Mariategui had to die then, but he did not believe it, and he did not believe it because he considered <coughs> that he had not yet fulfilled his mission. 
And we all know the superhuman efforts he then made to continue living, to continue his arrow path until he hit his target, until he cemented his fundamental work. The magnitude and importance of the work initiated by, by Mariategui make it seem to us not only that the life so fruitful and brilliant of the man who laid the first foundations of socialism in Peru, but also that of all of us who want to follow his example and continue his work of dignity is a short one." End of quote. There is undoubtedly in these textual representations of Mariategui's disability an evident allusion to Christian notions terms such as sacrifice and martyrdom, and the very idea of Mariategui's life as agony developed by the historian Flores Galindo, allude to the saints and to Jesus Christ himself. But as I suggest here, equally or more important are the allusions to exceptionality and overcoming, central to the figure of his supercrop. Mariategui's example for socialism was to be found not in his martyrdom itself, in his martyrdom itself, but in his ability to overcome adversity. The notion of Mariategui as supercrip is especially present in the narrative of the amputation of his right leg in 1924, which for lack of time I can't discuss here in detail. But I show in the paper how these uh, narratives around the, the amputation attribute to Mariategui a diminished body, but a whole masculinity, and above all, an intellect, a creative source that not only compensates for the physical deficiency, but also allows Mariategui with his body to, quote, reduce to invalidity to overcome the contribution of a non-disabled person. Now, these representations were not ch unchallenged. The founder and leader of APRA, Victor Raul Aya de la Torre, you can see the photograph here, had been a friend of Mariategui and had collaborated with him since the late 1910s, 14s. But the relationship broke down when Aya decided to establish a political party in 1928 to run for the presidency. On more than one occasion, the founder of APRA referred to Mariategui's disability to mock and stigmatize him. In March 1929, in a delirious letter to Eudocio Rabines, in which he calls Mariategui, quote, the most dangerous individualist and opportunist of the movement, Aya de la Torre directly mocks his disability, quote, Peruvian fascism will make a monument to Mariategui with a leg, end of quote. He continues in a way that suggests that Mariategui takes advantage of his disability to undermine him in alliance with President Leguía. Quote, when he had the leg, he wanted power. Now that he lacks it, he wants to appear as a Puritan. End of quote. In another letter, dated September 1929, Ayala de la Torre seeks to establish a contrast between himself, a man of action, and the APRA, a work of action, with Mariategui. Quote, I have always sympathized with Mariati. He seems to me an interesting figure of romanticism, of faith, and of the intellectual exaltation of a revolution. But Mariati <coughs> has never been in the struggle itself. I believe that no more can be demanded of him. Mariati is immobilized, and his work is merely intellectual. In our milieu, only action teaches the path of revolution." End of quote. Similarly, the poet and aprista leader, Magda Portal, refers to Mariategui's disability in an article published shortly after his death. She contrasts a Mariategui limited by disability, quote, forced by his disability to look at life from an armchair, end of quote, with a vigorous and dynamic Aya de la Torre. I quote again, Jose Carlos of Peru only knew Lima. And this is the great difference. While Mariategui, because of his physical tragedy, tragedy and his special inclination, dreamed and wrote, Aya acted. History will tell which of the two built on firmer ground. End of quote. Several of the themes already mentioned are present in Mariategui's self-representation of disability. His operation in 1924 occurred shortly after he took over direction of the magazine Claridad, which had been founded originally by Ayala Torre. Issue number six, published in September 24, an issue that was delayed partly because of the operation, Mariategui published a letter titled Words of Mariategui. The text is accompanied by a reproduction of the photograph that I've already mentioned. The issue also includes an editorial that mentions the painful Ill illness of Jose Carlos Mariategui, which momentarily deprives us of his vigorous and intelligent collaboration. 
and a short unsigned article on page 10, the Pagina del Proletariado, that refers to the illness and operation as, quote, the tragedy of Mariatti. <clears throat> These texts clearly serve to establish both Mariatti's centrality to the magazine and to the proven proletariat. If illness and disability tend to marginalize individuals, diminish their capacity to serve society, in this case, the rhetorical operation ensures that this is not to happen. In his text, Mariategui participates in this exercise. He writes that he does not want to be absent from the issue of the magazine because, quote, if it were to reappear without my signature, I would feel my physical brokenness all the more, end of quote. Like his biographers, Mariategui turns to the notion of overcoming. I quote, my greatest yearning at present is that this illness that has interrupted my life may not be strong enough to divert or weaken it. May it not leave in me any moral imprint. May it not deposit in my thoughts or in my heart any germ of bitterness or despair. It is indispensable for me that my words retain the same optimistic accent as before. I want to defend myself from any sad influence, from any melancholy suggestion. I feel more than ever the need for our common faith." End of quote. As we've seen, the amputation was traumatic for Mariategui and undoubtedly represented a turning point in his life. Before the operation, he had been able to pass as able-bodied, dispensing with a cane and relying on available technologies, such as the tram, which allowed him to operate in a way that conformed to a certain ableist normativity. After the operation, however, the need to use a wheelchair meant that his disability became not only visible, but defining. The cojito genial was now an amputee who had been saved from death and who could not disguise the wheelchair on which he depended. At the same time, as I've argued in my analysis of visual representations, Mariategui was able to give new meaning to his disability in a way that avoided the most common associations, particularly marginalization and vulnerability. So there are no studies on disability in Peru during this period, but we can assume that the disabled population represented a high proportion of the total population. It would have been composed of three main groups. One, people with disabilities caused by war, both the War of the Pacific, the War of Chile, and the Civil War of 1895 must have left many men with physical impairments suffered in conflict and mental impairments resulting from war-induced trauma. Two, people with disabilities caused by work accidents, both in urban and rural contexts, especially in industries involving heavy machinery or the use of explosives. And finally, three, people uh, with disabilities, disabilities caused by diseases of various kinds, from poliomyelitis to uh, tuberculosis, including mental and congenital diseases of various kinds. Although some disabled people, such as war veterans, receive financial assistance in the form of pensions and benevolent societies provided charitable aid to the poorest, in general, disability meant not only social marginalization, but poverty. The Work Accidents Law of 1911, one of the first laws of its kind in Latin America, indeed in the whole of the Americas, served to some extent to help those who, because of work accidents, suffered a disability that prevented them from working. But the law only applied to a small group of workers, mainly those who worked with machinery, and its application was always deficient. Mariategui's experience was not that of most disabled people in early 20th century Peru, or anywhere else for that matter. Despite his relative poverty, Mariategui had access to renowned doctors. He was attended by the French surgeon, Félix Larré, at the Maison de Santé at the age of seven, after his accident. The surgeon who operated on him in 1924 was Guillermo Gastañeta, one of the most renowned surgeons in the history of Peruvian medicine. The doctor who attended him when he was hospitalized at the Villarán Clinic towards the end of his life was Fortunato Quesada Larrea, who had been president of the Federation of Students and was professor of anatomy at the University of San Marcos and would become Minister of Health during the government of Benavides. As is well known, Hugo Peche, the specialist in Hansen's disease or leprosy, was a close friend of Mariategui and was one of the people who participated in the founding of the Socialist Party in 1928. Ligia's health minister, Sebastián Lorente Patrón, was a childhood friend of Mariategui. 
In short, Marietta was able to gain access to the cream of the Peruvian biomedical establishment, unlike the majority of disabled people who had to rely on so-called empirics, quacks, or simply had no access to medical care. Beyond access to doctors, Mariategui was able to count on the solidarity and support of individuals and collectives. Unlike many disabled people, his <coughs> physical disability, particularly after his return from Europe, was not, not a cause of isolation. Although he lost mobility, which limited his ability to travel within and outside the country, the photographic record shows that Mariategui maintained some mobility within Lima, thanks, thanks to his access to automobiles. Thus, he was able to maintain contact with the groups that he sought to relate to, such as the workers of the textile town of Vitarte during the plant festival, the Fiesta de la Planta, a yearly working class festivity, and also to have access to a certain level of leisure in places like the Bosque de Macamula, in this photograph, or the Herradura Beach. On the other hand, as is well known, his home on Calle Washington, Giron Washington, became a meeting place for intellectuals, artists, workers, and indigenous peasants who converged on the so-called Red Corner. These networks not only provided emotional support and solidarity, but also helped Mariategui to pay for some of the expenses caused by his, his illness. Thus, it is possible to conclude that, in contrast to the experience of most disabled people in the early 20th century, Mariategui's disability did not significantly affect his trajectory through the normative progression through the stages of life. He was able to enjoy, to a greater extent than most people with disabilities, a life that corresponded to ableist normativity, and particularly after his return from Europe, and notwithstanding the political persecution he suffered, middle class or bourgeois respectability. However, this does not mean that disability did not have an important effect on Mariategui's life. His correspondence allows us to understand the extent to which illness and disability affected him in two main ways. First, in the effect they had on his daily life and his ability to work and carry out his intellectual and political projects. And second, in how the expected or longed for resolution or overcoming of his disability converged with his project to leave Peru and move with his family to Buenos Aires. A recurring theme in Mariategui's correspondence after his operation is how illness and disability affect his ability to work. On the 22nd of August 1924, for example, he writes to Victoria Ferrer, the mother of his daughter, Gloria Maria, to whom he sends money. Quote, I am not well yet. My convalescence is slow, and the expenses that my illness has caused me and continues to cause me innumerable and considerable. End of quote. Mariategui repeats this point again and again in his correspondence between 1924 and his death. The letters record moments of improvement and others of worsening health and the effect of his disability on his mood and physical state. Thus, in May 1927, he explains to Javier Abril, the Peruvian poet, that, quote, I'm answering only today your two letters, one of November 16th and the other of December 30th, due to an excess of work that frustrates my best intentions of epistolary, epistolary punctuality. You also know that this exorbitant work weighs on a very resentful and unstable health, end of quote. In fact, health and disability are topics that are also addressed by those who write to him. Thus, in May 1927, Luis Carranza, the editor of El Tiempo, a newspaper in the northern city of Piura, wrote to Mariategui pointing out, quote, believe me that for me, one of your greatest successes consists precisely in the poor health that I know you enjoy, and that nevertheless, you work intellectually more than any other writer from Lima. This is an example and an exception to the habits of laziness which we criollos generally suffer. In February 1928, the Uruguayan poet Blanca Luz Brum mentions in a letter, quote, be aware that we teach all of us to support each other and to stand up straight. Precisely you, the materially handicapped, are the only one with the correct and definitive attitudes, end of quote. A few months later, the indigenista writer Gamaliel Churata, writing from Puno, uh, says, quote, 
I am very happy to know that the doctors have found a definitive way to cure the illness that mortifies you so much. This way, we will all win. You, because your work will be celebrated, and we, because we will learn from it." End of quote. These letters clearly show how members of Mariategui's network contributed to the narratives linked to the supercrypt figure and the notions of overcoming inspiration and exceptionality that characterize it. They confirm Simi Linton's argument that overcoming disability often does not come from within the disabled community, but rather, quote, is wish, wish, wish fulfillment generated from outside, end quote. So despite his disability, according to Carranza, Mar Mariategui worked harder than everyone else. According to Broom, Mariategui is physically disabled, but he surpasses others, even the non-disabled, by his correct and definitive attitudes. Mariategui's overcoming of his illness, says Churata, will be an example for others, for humanity. In this way, these narratives, while expressing an attempt to show solidarity of Mariategui, to demonstrate affection and support, also contribute to rooting the idea of the worthy disabled by assigning to Mariategui, just as many of his biographers do, aptitudes and capacities that in society's view compensate for and in some way cancel out disability. Several contemporaries and scholars have discussed Mariategui's trip, planned trip to Buenos Aires. As Alberto Flores Galindo has indicated, what motivated Mariategui's desire to emigrate to Buenos Aires was both the increased political repression of the Leguía regime and the feeling of being fed up with the polemics with Aya de la Torre and the Apristas. However, the correspondence also shows the extent, uh, to what extent Mariategui's disability was a determining factor in this project. Towards the end of 1929 and the beginning of 1930, Mariategui went regularly to the beach at La Herradura, or um, what were known then as curas de playa, beach cures. But although these beach sessions recommended by his doctors seem to have worked to some extent in alleviating the pain that he felt, Mariati gradually lost confidence that the treatment would cure him. Hence, the possibility of a definitive cure and a prosthesis, an access to a prosthesis in Buenos Aires, converged with the plan to escape the repression of the Leguilla regime. Uh, this was a plan that one finds in the uh, correspondence already in, in gestation around 1927, but that really comes into its own in November 1929, following a police raid on Mariategui's house. This police interve intervention, part of a larger raid in response to an alleged Jewish communist plot, seems to have convinced Mariategui to fain, finally undertake his plan to emigrate to Argentina. As he wrote to Samuel Glusberg, an Argentine publisher with whom he maintained a regular correspondence, quote, my intention to leave Peru with my wife and children is affirmed by these events. I cannot remain here. I will stay only as long as necessary to prepare my journey. I will leave Peru, whatever happens, end of quote. The correspondence illustrates the extent to which what motivated Mariategui's desire to move to Buenos Aires was the hope that he would be able to access better treatment and the prosthesis. In a letter to Glusberg written, written in December 1929, he states, quote, I have reaffirmed my intention to go to Buenos Aires and indicates that he's decided not to leave his children in boarding school in Lima. And then he puts forward a surprising comment in the way that he attributes ideas of health and weakness to countries and cities. Quote, the contact with a healthy and strong country will do me a lot of good, spiritually and physically. In Buenos Aires, the convalescence that the weakness of Lima has delayed will end. He recounts his discussion with Waldo Frank, who had just been in Lima. Quote, Frank thinks that in Buenos Aires, the problem of my mobility can be solved just as well as in Europe by the adaptation of an orthopedic leg. I believe that surgery and orthopedics are perfectly developed there. I would leave that for after my first stage of work but it is very important for my future. In his reply, where he calculated what Mariategui would need to earn to live modestly in Buenos Aires, about 500 pesos a month, Glasberg confirmed, quote, I believe that the matter of your mobility can be arranged in Buenos Aires and that you will even have access to the best doctors free of charge. <clears throat> of course, the orthopedic device will have to be paid for and it is expensive. 
However, we will get it. The importance of the trip for Mariatik is undeniable. It is clear also from his foreign correspondence with Waldo Frank that the latter had promised to help him so that he would be able to travel. Frank indicates in the letter that he has not only written twice to Glucksburg, but that he has also written to, to Victoria Ocampo, the writer and founder of 1931 of Sur magazine, who, uh, he says, may be able to help you. On the 9th of February, Mariatigui confirms to Glucksburg that the trip is totally decided and that he only needs to arrange some matters, such as the continuation of Amalta in Lima for as long as is possible. On the 16th of March, he again emphasizes the medical dimension to his trip, of his trip to Juan Marinello, the Cuban poet. Quote, I am preparing my trip to Buenos Aires, where I hope that by resolving the problem of my mobility, by means of an orthopedic application, I will resolve that of my health. Exactly one month later, on the 16th of April, Mariatigui died. So to conclude, um, I've argued that unlike most disabled people in the early 20th century, Mariatigui did not suffer systematic discrimination, discrimination, vulnerability, or isolation, even if his journalist colleagues and some political opponents mocked his disability or used it to attack him politically. Unlike Gramsci, his condition does not seem to have made him especially reserved in public or introverted. His experience was equally different to that of Randall Byrne, already discussed in the, in the introduction, whose deformity marked his life in such a way that as Paul Longmore and Paul Stephen Miller suggest, quote, disability constituted the core of his outlook on society, end of quote. For Mariategui, in contrast, disability was absent from his view of society, perhaps in part because his experience of disability was alleviated by the technology and network, network to which he had access. If Byrne included disability within a social and political critique, Mariategui did not. It was not a space that allowed him to reflect on, as disability historian Kim, Kim Nielsen suggests, quote, the role of ableism, built structures and social systems that favor the non-disabled in shaping relationships, systems of power, ideals, disparagement, and the multiple ways of being in the world, end of quote. Mariategui experienced disability as a personal misfortune and not as a social and political condition. It could be solved with medical interventions and a prosthesis. In this sense, Byrne anticipated what is called the social model, model of disability, according to which, quote, disability is a form of social political oppression born of a social organization that systematically excludes people who are called disabled and devalues them because, it's, because it is designed only according to the parameters of an able or normal body. While the Peruvian intellectual's vision corresponds to a greater extent with the medical model of disability, which conceives disability as a pathology that requires a cure and overcoming. That perhaps is why the Im imagery of the cojito genial was so successful, a representation that he, and to a greater extent his entourage, cultivated with care, as demonstrated by the visual and written, written repertoire that I've analyzed in this talk. This representation operationalized Mariategui's disability as the origin and trigger of his intellectual genius, and more generally as the central element of a narrative of heroic overcoming, the supercrip who in the face of adversity achieves exceptional accomplishments and becomes an inspiration to others. The narrative of Mariategui's experience with disability and his attempts at overcoming it served to shape the notion of Mariategui as a worthy disabled person for whose example others on the left and beyond were to learn. This component was central to the heroic creation of the Amauta of Peruvian socialism. Thank you.